Bran stands beside the weirwood, surrounded on all sides by a thick copse of trees. At his feet, he discovers a pool of blood, the tendrils of steam that rise into the crisp autumn air, telling him it's only recently spilled. He follows the trail through the foliage, stepping clear of the trees and onto a dirt path. He sees the carcass of the dead stag, and immediately understands where and when he is. He looks down the path expectantly and feels his heart skip a beat as a party of familiar faces come riding around the bend. Theon Greyjoy, Jory and Roderick Cassell, Jon Snow, Rob Stark, and the seven-year-old incarnation of Bran himself. Bringing up the rear, Eddard Stark sits high in his saddle. Ned dismounts and passes within inches of his son. Bran reaches out a shaking hand, the tips of his fingers grazing the silver fur of Ned's cloak. Father. Bran watches as a familiar scene begins to play out. Missande peers down into the yard at Tyrion, gingerly climbing down the stack of lumber. Tyrion, are you all right? I can't hear you. Play our last card. Missande nods and waves the prearranged signal. At either end of Winterfell's northern battlements, mounted on the corner crenellations, signalmen repeat her instructions with their own flags. Beneath the eastern and western walls, set back away from the battlefield, Tyrion's final gambit stirs into action. Thousands of mounted knights charge from cover on either side of Winterfell, shields and spears at the ready. They pass beyond the body of battle and arc about before turning their mounts inwards, creating a semicircle around the undead's rear. Recognizing their cue, the right and left bodies of the army of the living disengage as best they can and drop back towards Winterfell. The unsullied fan out and swap their sword and spears for the long rectangular shields they carry on their backs. The Night King's host is trapped once more, a wall of unsullied shields before them and the Knights of the Vale behind. The unsullied step forward in perfect synchronicity. On all sides, spears and swords thrust out from between protective shields and cut and slash and stab at the undead. The archers along Winterfell's battlements have never had an easier target. They dispatch a fusillade of arrows down upon the corralled whites, then knock again and loose another, and another, and another. It soon seems as though arrows outnumber raindrops in the sky above the battlefield. The Unsullied take another step forward and push the undead onto the spears of the Knights of the Vale, who return the favor and spur their mounts closer to pack the whites even tighter within their pen. Tyrion is not the only general with resources in reserve. Watching from their safe remove, the surviving White Walkers step forward and in a single uniform motion raise their arms, palms uplifted. First to rise are the Direwolves, Nymeria's pack springing to life and loping down the field towards Winterfell. Then it's the turn of the Dothraki. The ground itself seems to writhe and wriggle to life as the Dothraki dead disentangle themselves from their horses and clamber to their feet, the horses themselves rising on broken legs and shattered spines to stand beside their riders. The living watch in frozen fear as the mutilated corpses of their fallen friends begin to reanimate, their eyes the piercing blue of their icy lords and masters. Overhead, the rains suddenly stop, as though the heavens themselves are refusing any part in the slaughter about to unfold. In the sudden stillness, nothing stirs but the plumes of ragged breath among the living and the anticipatory clacking of teeth among the undead.
They're northerners and free folk, living and undead, pitch headlong into furious battle. Inside Winterfell, Aaron approaches the storage shed. Listening to the clamour of battle from his comfortable seat in the yard, Eric doesn't hear his friends scream, nor does he hear the footsteps approaching from behind. The reanimated corpses of Aaron and Maester Welcome pounce. Tactics and strategy count for nothing now. Both sides have exhausted their options. Everything's stripped away but the violent red chaos of mortal battle. Kill or be killed. Survive or die. The unsullied shield wall falters, then collapses as one unsullied after another is forced to turn their attention to the carnage at their backs. The combined weight of an undead Dothraki charge first buckles, then breaks the Knights of the Vale's lines. The direwolves do their part, dragging horses to the ground and biting and clawing at every living body within reach. Robin Arryn's finest find their advantage quickly reversed, crushed between the Dothraki undead and host of whites so recently destined for the points of their spears. In the pitch black of Winterfell's crypts, a candle flickers to life. Dana raises the anemic flame. Bronn sits against the opposite wall, his legs crossed in front of him, as relaxed as any man could be under the circumstances. I'm worried about Dara. I thought you were Dara. I'm Dana. Bronn couldn't possibly care any less. Do you think she made it out all right? I think Dara's probably dead. I want to go find her. You're going nowhere. We're going to sit back and bide our time until it's as quiet up there as it is down here. Bronn chews idly at his fingernails. I should be halfway to King's Landing by now. Bloody amateurs. If you wanted professional killers, you could have sailed to Bravos and hired yourself a couple faceless men. All right, all right, keep your voice down. But you wanted your killing done cheap, so you picked up a couple cutthroats and flea bottom for a handful of silvers. Keep your voice down. Who do you think's going to hear? It sounds like the seven L's have opened up up there, and there's nobody down here to... What was that? Probably just a rat. They both spring to their feet and take an instinctive step backwards. That's a big rat. Here, give me that candle. Bronn takes the candle from Dana and starts to creep one slow, careful step at a time, deeper into the crypt. Bronn draws his sword. I'm getting out of here. Dana flees from the noise, running blindly in the dark towards the crypt's entrance. She turns one corner, then another, finding only a deeper darkness where she expected to find the entrance. She pats the walls furiously with her palms, fumbling blindly to gather her bearings. Realization dawns like a date with the gallows. We're trapped! They've sealed us in! Bronn isn't listening. He inches his way deeper down the tunnel. Straining to see beyond the short circle of light cast by the candle, he brandishes his sword at the blackness beyond. The flame sputters and waves. Bronn freezes. A figure has taken shape at the very limit of the candlelight. Bronn raises his sword slowly, expecting at any minute to see the figure stir and lunge towards him. Gradually, the candle edges away the shadows that shrouded the mysterious figure. The statue of a long-dead Stark sits atop a squat stone tomb. Bronn breathes a sigh of relief. He's about to retrace his steps when something curious catches his attention. The face of the tomb is broken open, the stones spilled across the tunnel floor beneath the statue. Bronn doesn't even have time to scream. Bran stands at the side of the trail, a passive bystander watching his own past play out. 
The five direwolf pups bound for each of the five Stark children wrapped in bundles on Roderick's and Jory's lap. The party readies itself to move off. Bran looks past the dead mother wolf to the reeds of the stream bank beyond. John! Only a few paces behind the others, John stops in his tracks and tilts his head, listening to a voice on the wind. John returns and searches among the reeds. He raises Ghost by the scruff of the neck, the tiny white puppy mewling pitifully. Bran smiles to himself. Alerted by the rustling foliage at his back, Bran turns, <gasps> just in time to watch the Night King plunge a sword of ice into his stomach. Bran looks down at the crystal white blade skewering his middle and watches with curiously detached fascination as the Night King retracts his sword. Bran clutches his stomach, but can't stem the flow of claret gushing through his fingers. Sansa and Theon stand over Bran, listening to the war playing out just beyond the Godswood's northern wall. Without looking at him, Sansa reaches out and takes Theon's hand where it hangs at his side. Theon turns to face her. Get behind me. Theon draws and knocks his bow. Sansa follows his aim. Maester Wolken and Aaron have found their way to the Godswood. Spotting Sansa and Theon, the two whites break into a run, quickly eating up the distance between them. Theon buries two arrows into Wolken, but still he comes. Sansa rushes to Bran, covers her brother protectively with her body. Theon places his third arrow right between Aaron's eyes, and the guard crumples to the ground. With Wolken almost upon him, Theon swaps his bow for his sword, but loses his grip as Wolken tackles him to the ground. Sansa scrabbles in the undergrowth in search of Theon's lost sword, her hand finally finding the cool steel of its hilt. She takes a sure two-handed grip and plunges the sword into Wolken's back. Theon snaps off one of the arrows he fired into Wolken's chest and rams it through the maester's eye and into his brain. A look of horror crosses Sansa's face as she sees three more whites enter the godswood, Eric and Dara trailing behind the guard cut down by Bronn during his escape. Dara's head hangs grotesquely from the neck broken by Tormund. The guard still bears Bronn's dagger in his belly. Bran! Bran, wake up! We need to get out of here! Sansa grabs Theon's arm and pulls him towards Bran and the Weirwood. The pond! Theon, get him to the pond! Theon understands immediately. He scoops Bran up in his arms and staggers towards the frozen waters. Bran drops to his knees as the Night King grips his sword in both hands and raises it up, ready to deliver the killing blow. Bran closes his eyes, accepting the end. The Night King brings his sword down. Theon half runs, half falls down the bank of the pond. Theon and Bran plunge beneath the ink-black water. Bran's eyes fly open and he explodes to the surface, gasping for air. Bran! Sansa wades into the pond and takes over from Theon, supporting Bran's head above the water. Theon unsheathes his dirk and hands it to Sansa. Here, keep him safe. Theon hauls himself out of the pond and towards the oncoming whites. Theon, stop! Theon snatches up his bow, but his hands are frozen into clumsy, gnarled claws and he drops his first arrow. The second, he somehow manages to knock and loose, shooting directly through the guard's forehead. Theon's next arrow is dodged, and the next after that finds Eric's throat, but does nothing to halt his advance. Finding his quiver empty, Theon tosses the bow aside. He puts one steadying foot on Wolken's back, yanks his sword free, and charges to meet the two remaining whites. Somewhere amid the madness of the battlefield, Sam finds himself cut off and alone. He searches desperately for safe harbour, but finds nothing but dead and dying soldiers and an inexhaustible supply of blood-crazed whites. 
Sam slowly turns. Fifty feet away, an undead direwolf bares its teeth and crouches low to the ground in the predator's stance. <coughs> Sam flees, running pell-mell across the battlefield, wheeling into whites and bouncing off bodies in his mindless panic to escape the pursuing direwolf. Turning his head to check its progress, he trips over a half-buried body and splats face first into the mud. The direwolf is so close Sam can hear its dangling entrails slapping off the slurry as it runs. It's then that Sam's flailing hand finds the spear still gripped by the dead man that tripped him. Sam wrenches the spear free and rolls onto his back, stabbing the spear towards his hunter. Sam curses his own stupidity. He's holding the spear the wrong way round, the blade harmlessly by his side and the blunt end of the wooden shaft pointed at the onrushing direwolf. Before he can spin the weapon round, the direwolf bounds up a pile of bodies and pounces. Sam opens his eyes to discover the direwolf impaled on the end of the spear, six feet above his head. Hot, wet globs of drool splatter on Sam's face. The direwolf begins to slowly slide down the shaft towards Sam. He tries to roll away to safety, but the direwolf's weight has driven the spear point through Sam's leathers and into the ground, pinioning Sam in place. His eyes fall on the knife tucked into his belt, completely forgotten in his terror. The direwolf's forepaws are now close enough to rake their claws across Sam's scalp. He stabs at the direwolf's skull in a frenzied flurry. Over and over and over again, he rams the knife into the direwolf's face, long after the white has ceased to struggle. The white slides the rest of the way, and its entire weight settles on top of Sam. Blinded by the blood pooling over his eyes, he begins to panic, claustrophobia absurdly overtaking the hundred other fears crowding Sam's mind. Suddenly, Sam feels the spear jerk free of the ground and the weight on his chest slump to the side. He feels a pair of hands take him by the wrist and haul him to his feet. Sam wipes the blood from his face with both sleeves. Blinking experimentally, he finds himself looking into Grey Worm's calm and composed countenance. Sam does his best to babble whatever expression of gratitude he can muster. Thank you, thank you. I didn't think I... With a lightning-quick swipe of his dagger, Grey Worm opens Sam's throat. Sam's eyes open wide. He tries to speak. Bubbles of blood froth at his lips in place of words. Sam drops to his knees and slumps forward back into the filth, the light in his eyes extinguished. Grey Worm wipes Sam's blood from his face and dashes away to rejoin the fray. Missande stands frozen in place atop the battlements a silent spectator to Grey Worm's handiwork. She drops her flags and recoils away from the ledge, then races unsteadily down the steps towards the yard as Tyrion makes his laboured ascent. Miss Sande! I'm sorry, I can't. What are you doing? Come back! Tyrion continues up the steps, covering his ribs protectively with one arm. He reaches the battlements and takes in the scenes below. The Knights of the Vale, his last, best trick, have been wiped out by the undead Dothraki, zombified, and returned to the fray to fight beside their killers. The Northern Army looks a quarter the size it was before Tyrion's ignominious exit, and the only free folk he can find fight for the Night King now. He watches the same sequence play out all across the field of battle. Time and again, a soldier in the Army of the Living is cut down, only to rise again and turn on his brothers. Every man lost is a man gained for the enemy. Tyrion tries to quiet the pounding drums in his head as the surety of defeat resolves itself in his mind. This isn't a fight we can win. He picks up the flags dropped by Missande and waves them frantically. Sound the retreat! Get everybody back behind the walls! The northern gates of Winterfell groan slowly open. Everybody get inside! Move! Dovokinis! Amisegov over, Charon! 
Those Unsullied still alive to hear the horn, fight clear and extricate themselves from the chaos, falling back to Winterfell's gates, where they turn and form up to form a new defensive shield wall. The retreat is panicked and piecemeal, the Unsullied barrier porous and unstable. The first survivors through the gates don't waste another second before mounting the battlements and arming themselves anew from the barrels positioned at regular intervals beneath the crenellations. Just as the unsolid line looks ready to buckle, the weight of the undead front lines suddenly slackens as a bombardment of rock and stone rains down from above. Skulls explode in clouds of dust, limbs splinter and snap, and the flood of fleeing survivors ebbs to a stream. Theon clashes swords with Eric, parrying the guard's swing and slashing open his stomach with a swing of his own. Eric's innards spill to the ground, but the white barely seems to notice, clamping a frigid hand around Theon's throat. Dana lunges at Theon with her knife and stabs half a dozen holes in the small of his back. Theon drops to his knees, but still Eric maintains his grip. Theon's eyes bulge, his face turns an angry shade of purple, his arms fall limp at his side. The hilt of his sword slips through his fingers as the strength departs his body. With a sudden surge of adrenaline, Theon snatches up the falling sword and pistons back to his feet, channeling the upward momentum into a great arcing swing that cuts Eric's arm clean through at the elbow. Theon spins about blindly with his blade and severs Dana's twisted neck. Before her head has even hit the ground, Theon pivots on the balls of his heels and thrusts his sword up through the bottom of Eric's jaw and out the top of his skull. Theon collapses to the ground, the pools of melted snow and rainwater already turning red with blood. Jamie stands at the gates, waving stragglers inside the castle walls. Get inside! Hurry! Get inside! He finally turns to follow, then freezes. Brienne. Across the chaos of the yard, Brienne stares at him with lifeless blue eyes. Jamie's shoulders slump, and his sword drops to his side as all the fight drains out of his body. Only the support of a wooden stanchion keeps him on his feet. Not you, Brienne. Brienne charges across the yard. Jamie just has time to raise one arm in defense before he's bundled off his feet. Brienne lands on top of him, her upraised knee driving all the wind from Jamie's lungs. She bites at the air only inches from Jamie's face, the forearm that holds her at bay already beginning to weaken and waver. Brienne is so close, Jamie can feel her hot breath prickling his cheek smell the stench of death from the black void behind her gnashing teeth. The undead have rallied and quickly recovered the few feet of ground lost to the unsullied. Still the rocks rain down from the battlements, but for every white that falls, two more appear to fill the breach. The unsullied line is pushed by inches ever backwards, Grey Worm at their centre, trying and failing to find any kind of traction in the morass of mud and rain and blood at their feet. Seeing the last of the retreat make it through the gates, Grey Worm gives one last push against the wall of whites. The Unsullied surrender the line and hurriedly retreat through the gates. Those at the rear devoured by the undead surge, only seconds from salvation behind Winterfell's walls. The reanimated Ed staggers unnoticed into the godswood. Not more than 50 feet away, Sansa kneels over the insensible Bran at the edge of the frozen pond. So preoccupied is Sansa with removing her furs and wrapping them about her soaked and shivering brother, she fails to register Ed's rapid approach. No more than Ed registers the white shadow trailing him across the godswood. Davos and the Hound lead a rabble of soldiers pushing close the twin wooden gates, the weight of the undead advance pitched against them. Push, you fuckers! Straining every sinew to win even an inch of ground, the living desperately throw bodies against the gates, the human ballast ten men deep now. Those that slip in the mud are lost beneath the scrum and trampled underfoot. Those at the front 
crushed into unconsciousness against the wood. Finally, the two doors meet in their frame. Gendry and Beric rush forward with a heavy wooden crossbeam and pass it up and over the crowd until it reaches the front and drops into place across the gate. Ed lunges for Sansa. Sansa turns and instinctively throws herself across Bran, but the anticipated attack never comes. She opens her eyes to discover Ed pinned to the ground beneath Ghost's forepaws. The direwolf opens wide its jaws and closes them around Ed's head. Ghost bites down and crushes the white skull. Jamie reaches up his free arm and jams his golden hand into Brienne's mouth. She bites down and a shower of broken teeth fall into Jamie's face, blood dripping from Brienne's lacerated gums like slaver from a rabid beast. Jamie screams with the effort of pushing against his golden hand to keep Brienne at bay. The point of a sword sprouts from Brienne's skull. For the second time that night, she collapses lifeless into Jamie's arms. He looks past her shoulder and sees Podrick standing over them, sword in his hand and tears in his eyes. Cradled in Sansa's arms, Bran opens his eyes and looks up at his sister. Sansa? I'm here, Bran. You're okay. We're going to be okay. Bran's eyelids begin to droop. Bran? Bran! No! Bran! Bran's eyes close and his head drops limp to his chest. Sansa looks up from her brother, sees Theon laboring to drag himself through the godswood towards them. Is he alive? Is Bran alive? She looks into his desperate, imploring eyes and smiles weakly. He's alive. You saved him, Theon. I saved him. Theon collapses, the last of his lifeblood seeping into the frozen ground beneath his motionless body, his features set in a sad, triumphant smile. Every available body hurries to join those already manning the battlements, Arya, Beric, Davos, the Hound, Tormund and Gendry among them. The undead scrabble atop one another to surmount the walls, the pile of bodies growing and their distance to the crenellations diminishing with every passing second. The defenders hack and slash and stab and rain down rocks and arrows, anything to keep the undead at bay. Those whites at the top of the pile begin to pull defenders over, tossing them down into the writhing mass below. Arya draws her dagger and dances with an elegance that belies the pandemonium of the moment, stabbing and slashing incisively as she goes. Earning herself a half second of space, she sucks air greedily into her burning lungs. The world seems to slow down as she takes in the carnage all around her. The undead outnumber the living on the battlements now, with hundreds more whites pouring over the crenellations with every beat of Arya's pounding heart. She watches as the last stand of the living cracks, crumbles and collapses. Arya feels her senses overloaded. The screams of terror, the metallic tang of blood, the reeking of rotting flesh. Arya's face betrays an unfamiliar emotion. Fear. Retreat! Everybody retreat! Others hear her and take up the call. Retreat! All along the battlements, soldiers abandon their post and make a mad dash for the steps, but the undead immediately run them to ground. Men and women, mad with terror now, throw themselves from the parapet into the yard below. Tyrion hurtles carelessly along the battlements, running a deadly gauntlet through the undead. Finding the steps blocked with bodies, he veers quickly away and instead opts for an alternative means of descent. Launching himself from the wooden bridge to the broken tower, he crashes for the second time onto the stack of lumber piled against its wall, allowing his momentum to repel him backwards into the remaining ten feet drop down to the yard. Staggering upright, Tyrion feels his feet leave the ground as the frenzied mob rushing for the southern gates lifts him up, then slams him brutally back down. 
A boot slams into his jaw, and his vision fills with pinpoints of blinding light. He curls into a ball to protect himself from the ceaseless barrage of swinging legs and stomping feet. When he feels two pairs of hands grab hold of his shoulders, Tyrion is sure the Whites have finally got him. Uh, Tyrion! Opening his eyes, Tyrion almost breaks down in tears at the sight of Jaime and Podrick. They haul Tyrion to his feet and join the survivors retreating across the yard, the undead snapping at their heels. Winterfell's yard is filling up with whites as the undead tide crests the battlements and crashes down upon the fleeing defenders, swallowing up everything in its path. At the southern gates, Grey Worm rallies the last vestiges of the unsullied ranks to screen the retreat. The battle that began between two vast armies squaring off across the wide open expanse of the northern approach comes down now to close quarters combat within the four walls of Winterfell's yard, among just a few hundred soldiers, the living and the undead. Forming up in line before the gates, the Unsullied make their last hopeless stand. With short spear and sword, they engage the onrushing undead, every strike and parry buying another few precious seconds for the survivors to pass through the gates and escape the yard. Grey Worm swings time and again at an undead press so dense he no longer has to direct his blade to guarantee a certain strike. With all the anger and defiance left in his body, Grey Worm roars into the face of death, only inches from his own. All eyes turn suddenly skyward. A bright orange flower blooms in the heaviest of the rain clouds overhead, electric tendrils splintering and crackling through the thick vapor canopy until the sky over Winterfell glows an angry, pulsating red. The Unsullied dive to the dirt and take whatever cover they can. The sheltering sky splits open and the clouds disgorge a broad, unbroken shaft of fire. The whites at its center are instantly incinerated, those at its edges engulfed in rapacious flame that quickly consumes the close-packed undead army. The great black bulk of Drogon follows the fire through the clouds. The Unsullied clamber to their feet and escape through the gates as Drogon swoops down low over Winterfell, bathing the yard in another blast of sustained dragonfire. From his back, Daenerys directs him into a turn and comes back around for another pass. Dracarys! Every inch of the yard is afire, roasting whites screaming and screeching as they blindly clatter into each other in their mindless flight from the all-consuming flames. The few whites that succeed in escaping through the southern gates are picked off with ease by Beric and the Hound, Tormund and Davos, Jaime and Podrick, and all the men and women of the Northern Army still able to stand and swing a sword. Unnoticed in the chaos, Grey Worm slips away into the shadows. Grey Worm slithers through the postern gate and into the covered walkways that separate the godswood from the castle proper. Leveling his gaze on Sansa and Bran across the barren field of tree stumps, he draws his dagger from his belt. Torgonudo. Grey Worm freezes in his tracks. His eyes flit to his left and the portico leading to the castle's western tower. Missande steps clear of the shadows. They stare at one another for what seems an eternity, their features dancing and distorted by the irregular, flickering light cast by the looming conflagration of dragonfire. Grey Worm follows Missande's eyes to the blade in his hand. The look of guilt on his face slowly, almost imperceptibly, slides away, leaving something hard and hateful in its place. He tightens his grip on the dagger's hilt and takes a step towards the godswood. 
A dozen Stark soldiers suddenly spring from the dark doorway behind Missande. They rush to their lady's side, bundling up Sansa and Bran in their furs. Grey Worm sees his window of opportunity slam shut. He returns his furious gaze back to Missande. Hers never left. Daenerys turns her dragon northward over the body-strewn battlefield. The White Walkers mount their horses and spur them to a gallop, racing for the cover of the forest. But the world has yet to know a horse, living or undead, that can hope to outpace a dragon in full flight. Dracarys! All trace of the White Walkers blinks from existence beneath Drogon's blast. Not even their powdered remains surviving the white-hot heat of the dragon's fiery breath. From the safety of Winterfell's southern fields, the survivors of the longest night raise their voices in victory. Amid the celebratory crowd, Jamie turns his raw and bloody face to Tyrion and regards his brother with an expression discordant with the jubilation all around them. Where was he? Where's the Night King? Across the field, Arya follows Drogon's flight as Daenerys circles him above the flames that threaten to burn beyond Winterfell's yard and consume the castle itself. Where's Jon? The preceding podcast was entirely a work of fan fiction. It was unofficial, unaffiliated, and unauthorised. Neither the podcast, nor any individual involved in its production, is now, nor has ever been, in any way associated with HBO, Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin, or the Song of Ice and Fire book series. The podcast was, is now, and shall always be, entirely without profit. Neither the podcast directly, nor its makers indirectly, generate or receive any form of revenue or financial restitution that might otherwise accrue to the rightful copyright holders. The preceding podcast was entirely a work of fan fiction. We hope you enjoyed it.